Thank you, Lord. Turn around and tell somebody you love them this morning. Welcome to AFA. While you're doing that, I'll, I'll, I'll begin, but uh, last Sunday night, uh, we had a prayer meeting here, and we kind of miscommunicated. It wasn't just for ladies. The ladies had kind of instigated it and uh, instituted it, but we had a number of men here, and it was for everybody, but about 25 people showed up, which was awesome, and uh, I've been in some meetings with a lot less. Anyway, um, we've been interceding for months for some serious physical needs with people, um, and for revival, um, and uh, and it was it was a great time of uh, prayer and intercession and just uh, you know around the throne room and and it was it was good, um, but during that that time we came together at the end of this end of that and, and prayed together and uh, Russ Williams was sitting right there where Pastor Dave is and and he said you know. Some people have had dreams and visions about this church having a line of people standing in line waiting to get in, and the place full, and in order to get one in, and that's when someone had to go out the front door so they could come in the, the back door. And um, he said, you know, but that had never really been, if I'm, I don't want to misquote you, Russ, but, you know, never really been his dream or his vision, but, but um, uh, he said while we, were, while we were praying, he hadn't really considered that, but he said he saw this place filled with hurting, hungry people. Is that right? Is that what you said? You know, and, just, and, and people seeking the fullness of God. And, and he believed it. And, um, and he was expecting it. And we, we agree with that. We, were, we expect that. We receive that. And um, we've been doing some, I've been teaching on Sunday mornings in our Sunday school about the spiritual warfare. Because, you know, we're not wrestling flesh and blood. We're wrestling principalities and powers. And, and while I don't see a demon under every rock, we are surely, if you cannot see the hand of the enemy in what's going on in this nation and what's going on in this world, you're just not paying attention. And it's time for the church to rise up and take authority over that. That's the authority we have, certainly spiritual authority over the enemy, uh, the enemy of God, the enemy of God's people. Pastor Dave has also been teaching in here about the even greater works of God and, and, and the power of God's spirit to do, to do mighty things through us and about the anointing of God. And, you know, we all carry that anointing. Is that right? If you're a believer, do you have that anointing? Okay, so... Uh, I want to kind of roll all that together, and uh, the, the one thing that uh, Connie and I have been talking about, and she particularly, she says, Lord, what is the Spirit saying to the church? I, I mean, I, there's a, God is not short of things to say, but what is the Spirit saying to us, for us now? What is that rhema word, that, that alive word for right now, a now word? What is the Spirit saying? I can hear a lot of other stuff, and there's a lot, there's so many good things. It's like, it's like the problem we have with music these days. And didn't our worship team do an awesome job? We've got two, you know, worship uh, pastors on the maternity leave. Uh, and uh, um, uh, Noelle had her baby last week. I forgot uh, the name of the baby. Anybody know? Haven. Say it again. Haven. Haven. Okay, Haven. Well, congratulations to them. And Haven, if you're watching, uh, we're so excited for you. She was only 26 pounds, 32 ounces. I don't know. So, no, I'm just kidding. It's a joke. I have no idea. So. I saw, I saw on Facebook the other day a baby that was born 14 pounds, but uh, I, I, don't, um, I don't think I'd want to be that woman. But anyway, so we're waiting for those babies, but our worship team did an awesome job. But you know, the problem with music and worship today is there are so many good things out there. So much good music has been written. We, used to, we were lucky if we had a chorus, a sing-songy chorus we could sing about Jesus besides a, you know, how great thou art or something. But... Now there's so much good stuff. I mean, we can go, we, we could have all new songs from now until Jesus came and we would never sing the same song again. But that doesn't mean any of the other stuff wasn't good. But you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's really, I think one of the most difficult jobs you could do is have a, be a worship pastor because you're trying to hear what the Spirit wants for that day, for that service. But so I want to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So I want to share with you something today. And, and I, I believe this is the word of the Lord. So I want you to put that slide up for me. This slide is a picture of the Berlin Wall. Almost 32 years, November 7th, 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. Now, communism began in the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917. And so, almost 72 years later, 
The Berlin Wall went up in August of 1961. I remember that. And uh, I remember when Ronald Reagan, President Reagan, stood in front of the Brandenburg Gate and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And you know how many people prayed for years and years and years and years to see that wall come down. There were believers on both sides of that wall praying for communism to come to an end. 32 years they prayed for that wall to come down. I have right here a missionary friend of mine from Germany gave me some pieces of the Berlin Wall and because he was there when it came down. He picked up pieces and he pasted them on a, on a little plaque and I've, been having, I've had it on my desk forever. And, and, and uh, he came to me and said, this represents... This represents the prayers of the church because it was the church that brought the wall down. It wasn't Ronald Reagan. It wasn't Gorbachev, but it was Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you today that I want to share with you about the God of the breakthrough, the one who tears walls down, pulls down strong. You know, when we do spiritual warfare, what's it say? The the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, not fleshly, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God. That's spiritual warfare. That's what those people did for 32 years, to see that wall come down and to see communism defeated. Well, I want to tell you what. I serve a mighty God. And if he can pull down the walls of Berlin and the Communist Party, he can cure cancer in Jesus' name. So I want to share with you today that there is always hope. We know that. We say that. But you know what? No matter what you're going through, no matter what you are about to go through or what this nation is about to go through, who would have thought in nine months we have going to come this far? Huh. Um, but I want to tell you, there is still hope because we serve the God of hope. We serve the God of the breakthrough that's going to... He is going to send us that very thing that, you know, that we need. Sometimes he allows us to go through stuff. Sometimes he even breaks us as we go through there. But all I can tell you is the important thing is at the end of the day, we get the breakthrough because we serve the God of the breakthrough. We will receive it. It might take breaking. It might take a while. It might take 32 years of prayer. But one day, the God of the breakthrough will send the breakthrough, and the walls will come down in Jesus' name. You know, you can go a lot of places. You can go to a lot of things, but there's only one place you will ever find a breakthrough, and his name is Jesus. Nothing else will satisfy you until you find it. He revolutionaries, he, he revolutionizes your life. He will give us something to, he gives us something to hope for, something to have a purpose. You know, I, I play golf with a bunch of guys on Tuesday and some other days. And, and you know, uh, my father-in-law, you know, Connie's dad, Doug, you know, when we, we started playing golf here, he says, I've, I, he says, I've gone to heaven. I said, what do you mean? He said, these guys pray before we tee off. I mean, they pray they have a good game. No, they pray about Jesus Christ. I, and I, I said, oh, really? He says, I've died and gone to heaven. Died and gone to heaven. But I play with a lot of guys who don't really, they have a, a cultural Christianity. They know who Jesus is. They don't use his name in vain, but they have no concept of what I'm about to talk to you about. They have no concept of a God who does great and mighty things. They hope he might. They pray he might. And when I say, can I pray for him, they all say yes because they hope. But their hope is, I hope it happens. They have no concept that it will happen. And, And so, you know, Jesus, Jesus is the one who gives purpose to your life. They say, how come you're still, you're still working? I thought you retired. I said, I didn't see retirement in the kingdom. And as long as, you know, I can get away with getting up here once in a while, I'm going to take advantage of it. But if I don't ever get back up here again, I'm still going to be working for Jesus because that's my purpose. That's my calling in my life. 
Jesus is the one who brings significance to your life. You know how many men in this world search for significance, and they search for it in their jobs. And when the jobs are over, see, I see a lot of these retired guys, and what has happened to them, they have no purpose left. They have no significance because, because their job was their significance. And some of them were in insignificant jobs, but especially guys who were, who were uh, CEOs or who were, you know, who were managers and, and, and had important positions in, the, in their jobs. If they don't have that, they don't have much of a life. And a lot of these guys die qu- pretty quick. But Jesus is the one who changes everything, doesn't he? And, and in our, in our search for significance, we find it, we find it in Jesus Christ. And, and when we come to him, we recognize that we, we stand by faith and we stand upon the rock and, and, we stand for, and we stand for Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus brings us hope and he brings us healing and he brings us wholeness. And we, we have to fight the fight of faith. And you know, I'll tell you what, fighting the fight of faith is probably one of the hardest things you could ever possibly do is to know what God's word says and stand upon it, and pray for it, and not see it come to pass. But can I tell you, one day, the wall is coming down. Because the God of the breakthrough has promised, and he is not a liar. I don't care whether it's a job that you need, or it's, maybe it's healing, or maybe it's deliverance from addiction, may, maybe it's a, the, you know, your mind and emotions, a depression, or, or whatever it be, or a financial circumstance, or whatever we have to do. If you will just get to Jesus and hang on and find a way to get to him and hold on to him when you get there, you will see the breakthrough that you need. If you don't quit... If you will break through, you know, I, like I said, some of these guys just don't have any concept of what, most of the church doesn't have any concept. If you will break through the noise, if you will break through the lies, if you will break through the, the religious traditions, you will find, you will find the truth. And when you find the truth, you hang on to it with everything you got because it will come to pass, I promise you. I promise you, it might be a difficult road. It might take some work to tear those, the, the hypocrisy and the religious lies and the, everything else. But if you will hang on, you will see the breakthrough you need because that's who he is, the God of the breakthrough. I want to I share a story with you. I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Mark, chapter 2. I'm going to begin at the, at the first verse there. And Jesus has come back to his home base, his hometown, on the edge of the northern side of the Sea of Galilee and uh, Capernaum, and he's come there. And the, in the book of Luke, there's a similar, it's, this story is told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in Luke, it says the scribes and the Pharisees were there, the teachers of the law and, and you know, all of that, and the multitude was there. So let me begin with, you know, and it says he entered Capernaum again after some days, and it was reported that he was at home. So many people gathered together that there was no more room. You know, when you hear about when Jesus shows up in the house, suddenly everybody wants to be there. It's what you were talking about, Dave. People will know, hey, something happens over there at that church. Jesus is in that place. Well, it's not Jesus, it's people who have Jesus. But anyway, when you, the people find out that Jesus is in the house, that's what happened down in Brownsville. Before we had really, in 95, before the internet was really much of a thing, before we had Twitter, and before we had Facebook, people found out that Jesus was in the house. I stood in line for eight hours with people from Norway, people from Sweden, people from Europe, people from South America for standing in line in the hot Florida sun for eight hours. Why were they there? We heard that Jesus was here. The presence of God was here. And when God's presence shows up, people want to get near it. Anyway, there, were so, there was not even any more room, not in the doorway or even in the doorway. And he was speaking the message to them. Then came to him men bringing a paralytic carried by four men. So here is a paralyzed man being born on a stretcher, some type of cot, mat, whatever, by four guys. And since they were not able to bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above where he was. So 
They get to the house. They can't get in the house. The house is surrounded. Even the doorways filled up. People sur- I mean, these are little houses to begin with. I've been to Capernaum. I've seen the size of the house. They're all made out of rock and stone, and, and they're very small. So I can't imagine why he couldn't have gotten in. I mean, there was about room for 20 people in that house, maybe, if they squeezed in really tight. And anyway, so imagine. So they get there, and they say, well, we can't get in. So what do they do? They go up onto the roof. And it says, so when they got to the roof, they removed the roof where he was. Now, these are stone walls. They probably had thatched roof up on top or tiles on top. They got up above, and when they had broken through, they lowered the mat on which the paralytic was lying. Imagine if you were the owner of that house, and these guys have climbed up on your roof, and now they're kicking in your roof. Nothing is going to stop them to bring this man to Jesus. So... And so seeing their faith, and we've got so much going on here, seeing their faith, isn't that interesting? The faith of their friends. They weren't Job's friends, were they? They were friends who had faith. And so they, seeing their faith, Jesus turned and told the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes slash Pharisees were sitting there, and they thought to themselves, why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins except God alone? Uh, Yeah. Right away, Jesus understood in his spirit, he had a word of knowledge, you see, that they were thinking like this within themselves. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or or to say, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. But so you may know that the Son of Man has what? What? He said, I have all authority. And by extension, who else do you think has authority? We do. So that you may know that I have authority on earth to forgive sins. He told the paralytic, I tell you, get up, pick up your mat, and go home. Immediately he got up picked up the mat. Do you understand that when you read immediately? This man had been laying on a mat, had not moved his legs in we don't know how long. His legs had muscles had to be atrophied. They had to be sticks. And he says to that man, get up. That would have been impossible. But God, but God, but God put flesh on his bones, muscle on his sinew. It's that, it's that same story from his eagles that David was just talking about. Can these bones live? Can these bones walk? Well, but God, they can, of course. And, and, and as a result, they were all astounded. They gave glory to God. They said, we've never seen anything like this. Baby, you haven't seen anything yet. Jesus, the word of God, the healer, The God of the breakthrough was in the house. When the word gets out that he's here, you will not be able to. Russ, that's what the Lord showed me. That when people find out that the God of the breakthrough is in the house, you will not have enough room in the house. People will find wherever he is abiding. They will not be dissuaded. They will press in to get to Jesus like the woman with the issue of blood. Like the blind Bartimaeus. Jesus! Over here, Jesus! The crowds, you know, when we were in Uganda, I remember the crowds discovered something. That if they would get up on the stage, they'd get prayed for and be healed. There were thousands of people in front of us, thousands of people watching us. But if they got up on the stage, they were pretty sure they were going to receive from the Lord. We couldn't stop them. And I want to tell you what, that was a rickiest, 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 there you go, rickiest stage I've ever been on. When we, we used to have, they had a bunch of guys doing the worship at the beginning, and in Africa they dance and they don't stop. And the whole team was up there dancing. And I went out there early one night where the worship was going on, and that stage was going like this. And I was just thinking about all these people wanting to crowd up onto that stage that would never have held them, but by the grace of God. You know, but they knew if they got up there. Why? Because the anointing was up there. 
And they could not be dissuaded. You couldn't hold them back from crowding up the steps and swarming onto the stage. That night we prayed deliverance. We had people laying on the stage, crying, hanging off the stage, laying in the dirt everywhere because they wanted to get to Jesus. When Jesus is in the house, people show up. I think that will preach, don't you? Is, but here's the thing. Who's the house of God? Is he in your house? Is the God of the breakthrough in your house? Is the healer in your house? He is. And I got news for you. He wants out. He came to preach the good news, the word of God to those who were in fetters, chains and bondage. And four men had a friend who was in a desperate situation. Think about it. Those four men came bearing their paralyzed sick friend on a stretcher. He believed, I see, I believe that man had faith. That man probably said to his friends, get me to Jesus. And the four friends said, we're going to do it. They all had faith that they knew that they got their friend to Jesus, he would heal their friend. The place was packed. The altar, the church, the house, there was no seats left. Let me tell you, when I went to Brownsville, and I've been to other places the same way, there was no room in the house. We stood for eight hours, and you know what? We couldn't get in one night. We had to sit in the overflow. I've sat in the balcony. I've sat across the street. Why? Because, the, because Jesus was there. The presence of God was there. There was something happening. Now I know I'm a carrier of him, but I wanted to be where he was, where he was moving in power, moving in faith. You can't, you can't stand, but you, you've got to get there. You know, it's hard, it's hard to understand. But I've been in the overflow. <laughs> overflow is good, better than nothing, but I want to be right there. They would not be denied. What would you do to get your breakthrough if you heard there was a way for it to happen? It was a, over there, there was a place that was going to... You know what? Do you know how much people sp spend on medicine and drugs and doctors? But they, oh, got a new drug. We'll try that. And people rush to it and pay everything they can to get that drug that might save their life. Can you imagine what people will do if the healer was there? They would press in to touch the hem of his garment, wouldn't they? If it meant breaking through the roof, they would do that. Whatever it was, sneak in the back door. In this case, there was a roof that needed taken out. So they broke through the roof. They couldn't get a breakthrough, so they made one of their own. They broke through the roof. Isn't that what it said? They broke through the roof. The ceiling. You know what the roof represents? It represents the thing that was holding them back from getting next to Jesus. It's the ceiling was man-made. And it was keeping them from reaching Jesus. It was a house filled with Pharisees and scribes. These are, the, these are the religious leaders of the day had filled the house where Jesus was. Now think about that for a second. These religious late leaders, you know what they represent? They represent formalism. They represent bondage. They represent religious traditions and teachings that keep people from reaching the truth of Jesus Christ. The, the, the press around Jesus was filled with lies and disinformation about who he is and what he's willing to do. And I want to tell you what, that's the lie about the Pentecostal church, the charismatic church, that people do not understand. We have Baptists and other good people who, you know, who are saved. They love Jesus. But they, they will say lies about things that we believe. Why? Because I don't know why. The devil keeps them that way, I guess. But they don't want people to get to the truth. They said, well, you know, you've got to be careful of those people. They're crazy. You know, the Pentecostal church has been accused of attracting a lot of fruits and nuts. Hello, everybody. We're granola. But you know what? We love Jesus. Is that a meme? I think it is. Okay. St Steve always has something to say about what I say in here. I think I just gave him more ammunition. Okay. But you know, if I'm going to cut the tape, I would rather be a fruit and a nut for Jesus than stuck in religious tradition and bondage and not be near the truth. 
their lack of understanding is keeping them from getting the breakthrough they need. We got the truth. And the problem is so much of the church has not shared the truth. We try to share Jesus, but you know, how bold are we really? How bold are we when we realize that we, when you come to a realization that, you know why you have the blessing? Do you know, he just told you the blessing. Do you know why you have the blessing? To be a blessing. To show others the way. I'm only blessed to be a blessing. To say, hey, there's another way than what you think. Because the blessing I've got has set me free. And it will set you free too. And we shouldn't be keeping that good news to ourselves. we got to share it. We have to help others get through. We, we might have to break the roof for, for them to get them there to Jesus. But you know what? We have a responsibility to the truth. And we have a responsibility to the God of the breakthrough. And what Jesus did is he saw those four friends' faith in action. They were true friends. They were moved by compassion for their friend's need. They believed God, and, and, and they, moved by, they were moved by faith in Jesus. They would not be denied by a roof or the press of people. They carried their sick friend. Think about it. They had to carry that sick friend. Now, who knows where they came from? doesn't say. I doubt it was from Capernaum. I bet it was from some village some distance away. So they had to carry that guy on a mat, the four of them, until they got to Jesus. It cost them their time. It cost them their talent. It cost them their treasure. It cost them their strength. They were going to get through that obstacle to get to Jesus. Now, Jesus sees, sees that result of their faith, and what does he do? He turns to the man and says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Your sins are forgiven. Now, was that what that man needed? He was paralyzed. He couldn't walk. But you know what? <laughs> That's what he needed. That's what we all need. Son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus loves you. He died for you. The healing he was in need of was, was spiritual healing first. Now, Jesus didn't forgive that many that came to him, but here was an opportunity to, to teach something. Here was a house filled with scribes and Pharisees, teachers of the law, rulers of the religious order of the day, the house of hypocrites, if you want to know the truth about it. The house of legalism was there, and that was a roof that was keeping the kingdom of God from the people. And now it's broken through by the only thing that can break through formalism and false teaching and fetters. It was broken through by faith, Amen. by faith in Jesus. Because Jesus said, I'm a rewarder of those who diligently seek me. So he announces the ultimate, the ultimate healing, spiritual healing. He gives the gift of eternal life, oneness with God through the forgiveness of sin. He does what he came to do. He came to set the captives free. And he did for that man. He invaded Satan's territory. He pushed back the darkness. He released the real bondage of this poor soul. And, and, and what, isn't that what Peter said later? Jesus went about healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Amen. That man was oppressed by the devil. That man was made sick by the devil. That man had, was in need of healing. The Pharisees are afraid of Jesus. They wanted to be near him. Why, why did they want to be near him? They wanted to try to learn, try to understand the anointing he was operating, but they were really afraid of him. They were afraid of what he was going to do. They were looking for a way to find fault with him. How many times have we done that? I, I'm a, <laughs> well, I'll let that go. Um, they're, now they're going to plot to kill him because he threatens their ways. He threatened their finances. But, you know, I've seen religious people want to be near the river but rather than jump into the river, they stand on the bank and criticize everybody else that does. You know, when revival comes, and it's coming, because we're drawing to a close in this world. We're at the end. But when revival comes, it may not come like you might like it. It may come in a way you're not 
you're not used to. It may be a new thing. It may be something else entirely. Just because what happened in Brownsville doesn't mean it's going to happen like that here. It could be totally different. And the chance of you, uh, John Kilpatrick told me, it was a pastor of the Brownsville Assembly of God, that when revival hit, they lost half their church. But when revival hit, they were running 2,000, and when revival hit, they were down to 1,000. Because people sat there and criticized it. We even had, we even had, Pastor Dave was in Bible college at the time, we even had one of the, one of the uh, uh, main professors at Central Bible College put up a website on how come it wasn't of God. And yet millions of people came to it and came to a knowledge of God. You can wait just a minute because I'm not going to be done for 10 minutes. Okay. But that's the challenge is that when God comes, when the God of the breakthrough comes, he might come in a way you hadn't known. So they're afraid to confront Jesus in front of all the crowd. All they can think of, he's a blasphemer. Now, the question is, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? Well, if I tell you your sins are forgiven, how do you know they're forgiven until you die? But if I tell you to get up and walk and you don't walk, then I'm a liar. So Jesus said, what's is easier? Say, get up and walk or your sins are forgiven. Well, obviously, saying your sins are forgiven is easiest. But so that you may know that I have authority on earth to forgive sins, get up and walk. I want you to put up 1 Thessalonians 5, 1, 5 for me. Paul wrote this, he said, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but in, a, but in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So we didn't come to you just speaking, we came to you in the power of God. Also, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, he said, and I, brethren, when I came to you, did I came not with excellency or great oratorical skills of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. I was determined not to know anything among you except Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in much weakness and in fear and in trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but rather in a demonstration of the dunamis power of God. So why? So your faith would not rest on my words, but rather rest on a demonstration of the power of God. Which is easier to say, get up and walk, or your sins are forgiven. In the name of Jesus, I say today, by the authority of the name of Jesus, get up and walk. What could the Pharisees say? He got up and walked. And it confounded them, and it made them mad. How many need a breakthrough in your life today? Maybe in your family. How many know somebody else that needs a breakthrough? I'm telling you, it's time for a breakthrough. The God of the breakthrough is in our midst. He's here. We've gone behind the veil. We're in the temple. We've gotten near. He's the healer, and he's right here. The miracle worker is here. The breakthrough that you need for your personal miracle, for your physical needs, your emotional needs, relationships, finances, whatever they are, the river of God is here. The God of the breakthrough is here. He's in the house, and he wants to flow out of the house. He wants to go to the nations. He wants to take it beyond these four walls. When we pray for these people driving through the, 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 hollow, the, the pumpkin thing, the pumpkin festival, we're praying for them in the power of the name of Jesus. Let those people be healed and see a demonstration of the power of God as we pray for them in grace and in humility and not in arrogance, but with authority, with authority. And let it be the same way at your work. Let it be the same way at your school. Let the river flow. But can I tell you, sometimes when you've heard the word and you believe the word and when you discover the God of the breakthrough is there, you might still have to persist toward that miracle. And you know what that's called? Faith. Jesus asked the question right about this time. When the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? Do you have that kind of faith to believe? Do you have the kind of faith necessary to tear off the roof? 
and wait until you see the manifestation. It's hard. And I know there's people in this church and I know there's people we've been praying for who've been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And I tell you, it will come. It must come. The God of the breakthrough has prayed, has made a word. And sometimes we don't see it and I don't understand it, but I for one am tired of it. And I want to see the God of the breakthrough manifest himself in a greater glory than we've ever known in these days, in this time. Whatever roadblock's in the way, I want it out of the way. I want to I wanna just give you one quick example, and then I'm almost done. Here was a man who was born in poverty. He was faced with defeat throughout his life, but he knew he had a call of God for something great, some great destiny God had told him was his. His family was forced out of their home and he had to work to support them. Two years later, his mother died. Three years later, he failed in business. The next year, he ran for the state legislature and he lost. Then he lost his job. Wanted to go to law school, but he couldn't get in. The next year, he borrowed some money from a friend to begin a business, and by the end of the year, he was bankrupt. He spent the next 17 years paying off that debt, but he paid it off. The next year, he ran for the state legislature again. This time, he won. The next year, he got engaged to be married, but his fiance died, and his heart was broken. The next year, he had a total nervous breakdown and was in bed for six months. Two years later, he sought to become speaker of the state legislature, and he was defeated. Two years later, he ran to be be an elector from the state for for the national elections, and he was defeated. Three years later, he ran for Congress, and he lost. Three years later, he ran for Congress again. This time, he won, and he went to Washington and did a good job. Two years later, he ran for re-election to Congress. He lost. Five years later, he ran for Senate of the United States. He lost. Two years later, he sought the vice presidential nomination for his party's national convention, and he got less than 100 votes. Two years later, he ran for the U.S. Senate again, and he lost again. Two years later, he was elected president of the United States. And his name wasn't Bill Clinton. Abraham Lincoln. He would not be defeated. He pressed on. He persisted because he knew God had told him, I have a plan for your life, and it will come. He said this. He said, my path is worn and slippery. My foot has slipped from under me. It knocked the other one out of the way, but I've always recovered. And I always said to myself, it's a slip and not a fall. God is with me. He could have quit many times, but he never did. He fulfilled the destiny God had for him because he was born for such a time as that. Can I tell you today, you were born for this time. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of each of us. The one that did the miracles, the one that raised that man up off the mat, the one that brought about the breakthrough. So what breakthrough do you need? What's the word of the Lord for you today? Has he told you, do not fear, only believe? Has he said, I am the God that heals you? Did he tell you to be anxious for nothing? These aren't dead words from a book. These are words full of life, full of hope, full of healing, and his word is filled with power. I didn't come to you with excellency of speech. I can't be that good, but I know somebody who has power and authority over every need you have. He's the God of the breakthrough. His name is Jesus. Those four friends expected to see that word manifested for their suffering friend. But they would need a breakthrough to get to the one who was in the house. And you know what they did? They persisted until, until they got the breakthrough. Can I tell you something? Don't let your past experiences or failures or the time that you spent waiting, color your future. God has a breakthrough for you. Don't let people 
Don't let their expectations dictate to you what you believe. Don't let their beliefs color what you believe and what you know. Don't let defeat stop you from persisting until you receive the breakthrough because he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek them. You will get the breakthrough because the God of the breakthrough is here. He was there. And that anointing that he had is on you and me. That same spirit is inside you and me. And I can tell you what, this is supposed to be a hospital where people come and be healed, body, soul, and spirit. And that can't happen until you and I are healed. But when we receive the breakthrough, our responsibility is to share it. Revival may come, people will stand in the door, but what they will need is what you and I have already received. And if you don't know that for yourself, you're never going to be able to share it. But our responsibility doesn't end here by you sitting on a bench and getting excited. Our responsibility ends when we share it with somebody else who said, in Jesus' name, pick up your mat and walk. To show you I have authority on this earth, pick up your mat and walk. It's time for the church to rise up and be the church in persistent prayer. You know, praise God, we had 25 people here the last Sunday night. The next time we have it, I like to see everybody here. Why? Not just to go through a routine, because we're doing spiritual warfare until we break down the barriers. But it says we have weapons that are not fleshly, but they are mighty through God to pull down every stronghold. If the Berlin Wall can fall because of the saints of God in Germany and around the world prayed, what stronghold can come down in your life if we pray together? In Jesus' name. Bow your heads to me today. Father God, I thank you for your word today. Perhaps there's one here today watching by video somewhere that doesn't have that relationship with the God of the breakthrough. First of all, he wants to do what he did for that man on the mat. Child, your sins are forgiven. How do they get forgiven? By asking. They saying, Father, I, I, ask, I repent of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart and live big in me. If you will pray that prayer, if you will say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins come into my heart. I want to know you. I need a breakthrough in my life. I, I, I need to know you. I want eternal life. I need to be forgiven. I know it. All you've got to do is ask. And he is faithful, as he said today, faithful to do it. Don't be afraid of what's coming on this world, he said. Because if you're right with God, you will be safely held in the hollow of his hand. It doesn't mean these things might not hit you, might not come around you. But you know what? At the end of the day, you're going to be with Jesus forever and ever and ever. Father, I thank you for those that are praying that prayer even right now. And for the rest of us, the God of the breakthrough is your God. He has made a way for you where there doesn't seem to be a way. Sometimes we go through these things. Sometimes we hang on and hang on and hang on. But I'm telling you, the time of waiting is nearly done. The time of waiting is done because the God of the breakthrough has promised that you might know he has authority to forgive your sins. Rise and be healed in Jesus' name. Receive your breakthrough today and then share it with somebody else. In Jesus' name, Father, I thank you for healing. I thank you that there is no cancer. Lord, we've been praying for a lot of people around this country that have a need in their life physically. Lord, I declare today the God of healer, the, the God who heals, the healer himself, the God of the breakthrough has made a way for them and they shall not die but live and receive and re be restored in Jesus' name. Every need is met by the God who breaks through all the noise and brings us life. In Jesus' name, receive it for yourself. Stand to your feet with me. Let's sing this song and let's declare our breakthrough is here. And then let us do what Dave told us to do. Pastor Dave said, go and tell somebody about it. Lay hands on them and declare with authority that Jesus Christ has made them whole. In Jesus' name, God of revival. Hey, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed that. Hope it ministered to your spirit today. And uh, let me tell you, if you want to see more videos from us, be sure to hit the like button or the subscribe button. And uh, also, we're live every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Hope that you can join us. Hey, keep living the abundant life that Jesus called you to live. God bless.